खुशी के लिए काफी है को प्रेजेंटेड बाय कॉइन डी सी एक्स योर गेट वे टू क्रिप्टो Hello and welcome you with us here on Business Today. I am Abha Bakaya. Here are the day's top stories. Two days after his horrific accident, last rites held for former Tata Sons chairman Cyrus Mistry at the Worley Crematorium, attended by top business and political leaders. Tata family matriarch Simone Tata also makes an appearance. Second day of floods nightmare for Bengaluru incredible visuals of luxury cars under water CEOs traveling to offices on tractors of life in India Silicon Valley thrown completely out of gear What are the seat belt rules for car insurance does your auto insurance cover calamities like Bengaluru floods we talk to an expert to remove all your doubts Volatile day of trade on the Lal Street. Sensex ends in the red. Nifty around 17650. Oil and gas, power, metals, stock gainers, financials drag. Dream folks makes a dream debut on the bourses with 56% premium. The script lists at 508 rupees against the issue price of 326 rupees per share. While Ratan Tata is yet to issue a public statement on his death, Cyrus Mistry's funeral had the Tata family matriarch, the 92-year-old Simone Tata, in attendance. Here's the story. Two days after his untimely demise in a road accident, the mortal remains of Cyrus Mistry were confined to flames in Mumbai this morning. Present at the Worley Crematorium were the who's of who of industry and politics. In attendance, Mukesh Ambani's son Akash, politicians Milind Diora and Supriya Sule. Deepak Parekh was also there, as was Anil Ambani. But it was the arrival of the 92-year-old Simon Tata, who is the stepmother of Ratan Tata, that drew attention at the last rites. The late Cyrus Mistry's sister Allu is married to her son Noel Tata, the chairman of Tata Trend. So, who is Simon Tata? Born in 1930 and brought up in Switzerland, the grand old dame is credited with creating India's first global cosmetics brand, Lakme. She met Naval Tata during a visit to India in 1953 and got married two years later. Lakme had been set up as a subsidiary of Tata Oil Mills by J R D Tata in 1952. Simon Tata joined the company as managing director in 1961 and was elevated to chairman in 1986. It was Simon who is credited with making Lakme a household name and has been acknowledged as a doyen of the Indian beauty industry. Repeatedly breaking the glass ceiling, making her own space in a strongly male dominated world. In 1996 she oversaw the sale of Lakme to Hindustan Unilever for 200 crore rupees but stayed her course by establishing Tata Trend with the proceeds and helping it in the initial years. A look at the Tata family tree shows just what a legacy Simon Tata has had to preserve. The Tatas began with two offshoots one the descendants of Ratan Dora Tata and the other of Kavasti Manik ji Tata. The fourth generation of the Kavasti family included the iconic J R D Tata, considered one of the builders of the modern Indian industry. The two trees were joined by a wedding between Nusarwanji Ratan Tata and Jeevan Bhai Kavasti Tata. Three generations down came Naval Tata, who married Sulu Commissariat and had two children, Ratan and Jimmy. His second marriage was to Simon Tata. The two had a son, Noel. Noel Tata married Cyrus Mistry's sister Allu. Cyrus Mistry's tragic death is a double blow for his family. Given that the, the patriarch Palonji Mistry had passed away in June at the age of 93 years, and while the very public feud between Ratan Tata and the Mistry family doesn't seem to have been forgotten, the presence of Simon at the funeral is being seen as a graceful final goodbye to Mistry.
Bureau Report, Business Today Television. As Bengaluru sinks, citizens have been rendered completely vulnerable to nature's wrath. The incessant rainfall in India's Silicon Valley has not even spared top bosses of the tech world. Villas, upscale apartments with swanky cars are all underwater. And the saviors now are tractors and JCBs. Take a look at this report. Battered and inundated. Silicon City, Bengaluru is sinking. Streets of the posh Yemalur neighborhood turned into a lake. The chariots of the rich are submerged in water. While the high end luxury cars rendered useless, residents resorted to the humble tractor trolleys to escape the vagaries of nature. Lexus, Bentley, Audi Q5 and even Land Rover Range Rover have drowned amid incessant rainfall in the city. The city which houses thousands of tech startups and at least 40 unicorns saw its wetted day in about 8 years on September 5th. The IT hub of the city is incurring losses of over 200 crore rupees a day. From offices of Vipro to Deloitte, all are underwater. Floods did not spare the honchos of startup world either. Arjun Mohan, CEO of the Upgrade, was forced to take a tractor to reach office amid crumbling infrastructure. CEO of the Unacademy, Gaurav Munjal, had to hop onto a tractor with his family and pet after his housing society was submerged in water. But why does the city flood every time it rains? Unchecked urbanization is adding to the vows of the Bengalurians. Encroachment of stormwater drains, no water outlets for new roads, drains clogged with silt and sludge had led to the city sinking in flood water. Moreover, the excessive rainfall has led to the IT city choking up. The waterlogged city lays bare the civic mess and a need to reboot the IT city of India. While the citizens grapple with the flooded city, when will the government pad up to wade the city out of turbulent waters? Bureau Report, Business Today Television. An unexpected natural calamity like the recent floods in Bengaluru or a highway accident can cause irreparable damage to your vehicle. My colleague Tina Jain Koshal spoke to Adarsh Agarwal of Go Digit General Insurance about what's covered and what's not covered under your motor insurance policy when it comes to eventualities like floods and road accidents. I want to ask you, with news of floods coming in from Bangalore and other parts of the country, does our motor insurance policy cover flood damage? So thanks, Tina. Thanks, me. Thanks for having me on board. Uh, so there are two types of insurance policies which are provided to motor insurance. One is comprehensive insurance and one is a standalone third-party insurance. So flood-related claims or water ingression-related claims those are covered in the comprehensive policy of motor insurance, but it is not covered in the third party only insurance policy. Okay, so you are saying it is covered under own damage, but not third party motor insurance. Uh, yes. uh, so, so it makes sense to have a comprehensive motor insurance policy. So it, uh, it, uh, I come to the next questions. When, it, when we talk about motor insurance, what are the exclusions under these circumstances which, should, which we should know in advance? before claiming? So specifically, if I talk about the flood related incidences and flood related claims, so there is no specific exclusion under the own damage section, which excludes the claims related to flood or watering related claims. Only aspect is there is a term called consequential loss. So for example, let's say you are driving the vehicle through a flooded road and your vehicle is fine. But through the silencer, there could be some water which is getting into the engine of the car. That is a consequential loss because of water going inside the engine, engine might get damaged. So that is not covered in a traditional motor insurance policy without any add-on cover. However, various companies have come up with a product called a engine protect or engine protection cover, which essentially covers the consequential damage to the engine because of water getting into the engine. So looking at current scenario, it's very much recommended for the policy holders that whenever they are buying a motor insurance policy, they should also check what kind of covers they are taking as a covers 
and in current situations of rains and other things the engine protector becomes one of the important cover that policy holders should choose uh, adarsh i come to another point we heard this week uh, shocking as well as sad news about the passing of sidas mistri in a car accident so the incident has brought into the limelight that many people actually don't wear their seat belts especially when occupying the rear seat of a vehicle so my question is does the insurance company pay claim if the passengers or drivers were not wearing belt at the time of at the time of an accident so insurance company cannot repudiate a claim in if even if the you know person who are sitting on the back seat they are not wearing the seat belt but it is a contributory negligence on part of the policy holder or the occupants second thing is ki the airbags airbags are the secondary protection in the car primary protection is your seat belt so it's very much recommended that even if people who are sitting on the back seat of course front seat as well everyone should wear seat belt otherwise what will happen that the even in case of an accident or a major impact airbag might not get deployed because you are not wearing the seat belt so it's very much important that everyone should wear the seat belt okay so the point is the insurance company will not reject your claim might not reject your claim but it is important to wear a uh, seat belt as a precautionary measure definitely that's right The IT sector has been in the limelight of late with the debate on moonlighting heating up. Kiran Karnik, former president of NASCOM, shares his views on moonlighting. He also talks about the lack of pay parity in the sector. Here's an excerpt of that conversation that he had with my colleague Akanksha Chaturvedi. So my one of the most burning topic in the past few weeks has been the whole moonlighting debate in the IT sector. Should employees take secondary employment out of their day jobs? What's your take on this? Well, you know, it's an issue that's a little complex. Yeah. But at first cut, if you just ask me my bottom line, yeah. I come from a generation in which if you took a job, yeah. you were devoted to that job. All right. And so moonlighting to me seems a bit iffy. Okay. Full time in something. There are a number of reasons why it doesn't seem quite right. Okay. It's not just the contract or the formality, but it's also other things. I remember in the days, and we're back to the man for three in Bangalore, okay. when traveling to an IT company in Bangalore took so long and so exhausting. That the standard complaint we used to make to the government was, hey, if you don't improve the roads, our labour productivity is going to come down. Okay. The employees are all coming to work tired. Yeah. And pretty much the same would hold for moonlighting. I may okay. say, look, I am here nine to five. Rest of it is my time. Yeah. True in a way, I quite understand that. And but working there, you know, it has its plus and minus. Now you might well say, what if I go and party? Fair enough. <laughs> so I, that's why I said it's a bit complex. But yet, you know, on the face of it, to me, if you have a full-time job somewhere. And you're properly employed, meaning yeah. you have social security, you have all the things that are there for long-term employment. Then it doesn't seem right to me to be working elsewhere. There are issues of conflict of interest. There are other kinds of things related to fatigue. There are other okay. kinds of things related to what information are you carrying back and forth okay. unintentionally. So I'm not really a great fan of moonlighting, mm. and I know many young people would slam me for that. But, <laughs> You know, I don't think it's quite right. So, talking about the IT sector employees, there have been many complaints that there's no parity in the salaries given. So, uh, employees who were freshers back in 2008, 9, they were giving getting the same 3.5, 4 lakh rupees. That is also the salary of freshers, lower level freshers starting out right now. But whereas you see CEOs, CFOs, they get a lot of money. So, do you think there is? Uh, do you also agree with what the employees think that there is some? You know, there is a misconnect and the lower level employees or the lower band of employees are not being paid enough. Well, the inequity in our society across the board yeah. is terrible and it's frightening. Yeah. But you know, end of the day, we have to understand that talent yeah. is fungible. Yeah. It moves across the world. That's true. Right. For the top level talent, yeah. not just CEOs, for any kind of specialized top level talent, the market today is global. Hmm. And if you don't... Not just pay them well enough, yeah. but look after them. I would say in yeah. all senses well enough, they will go elsewhere. That's true. Elsewhere in the world. Yeah. And who's the loser? The company certainly, but the country too. Yeah. So I think there is you know, an argument to be made for looking after people well. But looking yeah. after people well includes all your people, not yeah. just the top ones. That's true. You got to pay your startup employees also fairly. Now, what is fair is arguable in our yeah. context. We are a very poor country. Yeah. Somebody who earns, you know, twenty, thirty thousand a month. Is not too badly off, okay. by absolute standards. In relative right. standards, compared to what his or her CEO is getting, yeah. it's a horror. True. Yeah. So I see that problem, and therefore companies that do well, and particularly you're right, you refer to the IT industry. These yeah. companies, you know, are 
very profitable, they make good money. And I think many companies, well, at least some, set the pattern yeah. by giving ESOPs down the line. Yeah. I know companies that gave ESOPs to their car drivers. Okay. And, you know, I used to be a joke in one of my old organizations saying, hey, you know, guys in the IT industry, it has a job as a driver in X company because <laughs> they had ESOPs, which are great. Okay. I think, you know, that may be an extreme. But one way is to certainly try and spread the benefits and wealth that the company creates to many more people and allow them to participate in it in a much bigger way. But differentials in salaries yeah. between companies and within companies will always exist. Right. Now, what's a fair differential is arguable, but certainly it shouldn't be something horrendous. I quite agree. Okay, sir. Talking about the fungibility of talent, you spoke about it. Uh, the the recent attrition rate has been rising in the IT sector. Talk about Wipro. The their attrition rate rose, you know, double. Their attrition rate doubled in the past four quarters. Even TCS, Infosys, all these companies saw a steep rise in their attrition rate. So, what do you think? Like you said, maybe it's because of the pay, not the benefits. I mean, employees are not feeling like they are getting all the benefits. So, what do you think might be the other reasons why employees are actually changing jobs so frequently? Well, attrition, I don't think, is due to what people are paid alone. All right. It's a function of demand and supply. Okay. And the demand at the moment for certain skills, in particular in the IT space, yeah. tech space in general, yeah. is very high. Okay. Both in India, not just globally, even in India. And therefore, there is a temptation of getting you know paid 15, 20 percent more. Hmm. Plus, there is a the thing of many people who want to, after, particularly after COVID, yeah. want to go back to whatever hometown is. Okay. And so, you know, if I'm working in Bangalore yeah. and, you know, I'm from northern parts of the country, if there's yeah. a good job going in NCR or in Chandigarh, I might well go in. I, oh, yeah. Earlier, I might have hesitated. Mm. Now, there's a good job and they pay me more. So, why mm. not? I get the benefit of being closer to or at home and get paid more. So, I think there are different drivers okay. to the attrition that you're seeing. Dreamfolk Services, airport lounge services provider, saw a dream entry in the stock market, shares listed at a premium of 55% and exceeded estimates. The script got listed at 508 rupees per share against the issue price of 326 rupees. Dreamfolk Services is a dominant player at India's largest airport service aggregator platform. The company enjoys a 95% share in the airport lounge business and facilitates access to 54 operational lounges. Dreamfolk provides services to all card networks operating in India. The issue was entirely an offer for sale by shareholders in which the promoters also diluted their stake. The capital raised will be used for global expansion and for increasing employee base. While the company made a stellar debut on the bourses, some analysts now believe it's time to book profits. Many believe it's richly priced, leaving little room for upside. We take a very quick break. We'll be back with more on the other side. Battery swapping was a real game changer and is a real game changer as we go into other markets, large scale markets.
Welcome back. Who are India's highest paid business leaders? Are they the Adanis or the Ambanis who sit at the top of the world's richest list? Or are they the IT and startup wonder kids who have put India on the entrepreneurship map of the world? Business Today TV did a deep dive into the BSE record to bring you this report. These are the kind of earnings which few focus on but everyone wants to know. Information which is available only after a deep dive into corporate notices filed with stock exchanges. But this is what we got to know. Leading the list of India's highest paid business leaders in India in 2021 and 22 is Sajjan Jindal of JSW Steel. Jindal was paid nearly 135 crore rupees for his role as the chairman of the JSW Group. He is followed by C. Vijay Kumar, the CEO and MD of HCL Technologies, who earned 123 crore rupees. Completing the top three list is Shantanu Khosla of Crompton Greaves, who earned around 118 crore rupees. Others in the top list are Murali Devi of Devi Labs. Sun TV Networks, Kalaniti Maran and Kaveri Kalaniti, each earning 87 and a half crore. Hero Moto Corporation's top honcho, Pavan Munjal, earned 84.4 crore rupees. CEOs of the other top three Indian IT companies completed the top 10 list. With Wipro's expat, CEO Terry Delaporte earning nearly 80 crore rupees. Salil Parikh of Infosys making 71 crore rupees and Tech Mahindra CP Gurnani getting a package of nearly 63 crore rupees. Interestingly, looking at the top 50 highest paid executives, the largest number is not from the new age industries. 11 of the top 50 business leaders are from the auto and ancillary sectors. 8 are from the healthcare industry and 7 are from the IT industry. Startups and the recently listed fintechs are largely absent from the list. It is, however, certain that they will soon find mention in the list. With Prince Tyagi, Bureau Report, Business Today Television. A new iPhone 14 lineup will be showcased tomorrow at Apple's annual flagship event, which is going offline after a two year COVID 19 hiatus. A big question remains, though, how much Apple will charge for the latest models at a time when soaring inflation has triggered fears of recession. Watch our special report to find out what you can expect from Apple's flagship event. iPhones are coming your way, the iPhone 14, 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max. But this year, we might see a brand new iPhone, a standard model with a bigger 6.7 inch screen. So if you prefer a device the size of the Pro Max, but don't want to shell out that extra buck, then you might have a standard version with a bigger screen that's being launched. The sad news there is for all fans of the iPhone 13 mini, it's being reported that Apple might be doing away with the smaller iPhones altogether. And so the iPhone 13 mini might be the last such device with the 4.7 inch screen. This year's event invite carried the tagline far out which could be the tech giant's way of alluding to a new astro photography feature on the iPhone. Apple fans will also be hoping for a better camera sensor and improved design maybe and that means they will ditch the knot for good and say hello to 2022 finally. It turns out there's a lot of cues that Apple can take from Android after all. New Apple watches are on the cards and there's a twist here too. While a new series 8 and SE model is expected, Apple might finally be launching a third Pro model as well. We're expecting a bigger screen and watch build for a more durable outdoorsy use case. New features across the lineup could be a body temperature sensor and better sleep monitoring capabilities. And one more thing, there's always a surprise at Apple events and Team Tech Today thinks that this might just be the new AirPods Pro finally here. So if you're in the market for a new Apple device, hold on to your horses and take a call only after September 7th. And that's where we leave it on the show today. Thanks so much for watching.
make your media plan smarter with India Today Live TV on your connected devices.